You've entered Bookstorm with Kristen Civiletto and me, Chris Storm. This is a podcast devoted to best-selling books that matter, books that make a difference. We're diving down deep with beloved authors about their stories. We're exposing hot-button topics and heartfelt themes, the issues that affect each of us in our own lives as siblings, parents, partners, friends, as human beings. We're braving new ideas, fresh thoughts, hard lessons and important truths. Those kinds of things that stay with us long after we turn the last page and close the book. Book lovers, we have a special guest with us today. You're going to be super happy to see Jacqueline Michard on Bookstorm. Jacqueline, welcome. Thank you. We're Thank here. You. We're here to talk to her about a new book, a very inconvenient scandal that Kristen and I loved. And I'm just going to give a little shout out because we're pretty excited to announce that Bookstorm has loyal listeners in 69 countries, 1,300 cities and 48 states. So Alaska and South Dakota, come on, get with the podcast. (laughs) We love all of you. We're grateful to all of you. And we know why you're here because we have authors like Jacqueline Machard. Now, before we get started talking about this book, I got to give you a little bit of her bio because it's super impressive. And Jacqueline, you have a lot of fans, but a lot of times people don't take the time to look up a little bit more about you. She is the New York Times bestselling author of 23 novels for adults and teenagers. She's the recipient of awards like Great Britain's Talk About Prize, the Bram Stoker and Shirley Jackson Award. She was shortlisted for the Women's Prize for Fiction. She has endorsements by people like Stephen King, Kristen Hanna, New York Times Book Review, People Magazine, USA Today, and two of Bookstorm's good friends who have been on our show, Adriana Trajani and Robert Dugoni, who we love. Now, her first novel was the first Oprah Book Club pick. Am I right about this? That's right. The Deep End of the Ocean, that, and I remember it, and so does Kristen, it was adapted into a major film starring Michelle Pfeiffer. That is cool. Jacqueline's essays have been published in magazines worldwide and even incorporated into school curriculum. She's a Chicago native, and this is so cute. She grew up um, as the daughter of a plumber and a hardware store clerk who met as rodeo riders. Okay, this is for all of us out there who have a bucket list. Go do your thing. Be a rodeo rider. (laughs) She is the Distinguished Fellow at Ragdale Foundation and the DeWitt Clinton Reader's Digest Fellow and, and at the McDowell Colony. She's taught MFA programs for creative writing in all sorts of colleges and universities. She was the speechwriter for the Secretary of Health and Human Services under the Clinton administration. Jacqueline, what more could you possibly do? You are amazing. And she is a popular st- speaker at literary events. And this, last but not least, because I love, love, love this. She lives in Cape Cod with her husband and nine kids. Nine kids. That Wonderful. I know of. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are just amazing. And we love this book. Welcome to Bookstorm. Thank you so much. I am so impressed by your demographic information. That is absolutely crazy. All podcasts about books are lovable, but some of them, I mean, you it's it's broadcast on a military base in Guam at one in the morning and there's six <laughs> people listening and they're all, all they want to know is you know what religion i am or something like that it's <laughs> well, very you- it, it it's a very sort of it can be a very targeted thing but you guys cover the waterfront well, we're very, thank you for saying that. We're very proud. And um, we believe, we've only been at it for two years. We believe the reason is Kristen and I read every book cover to cover. Our questions are because we read, we vetted, and we love this book. And um, that's what I think it is. And beautiful authors like you, of course, that's why we're here. So thank you. I had to do homework about your questions, my dears. <laughs> okay. Let me tell you, because they were so 
penetrating and and thoughtful. I'm used to um, people asking questions like, uh, well, how do you get your ideas? You know, I mean, the first thing that people ask authors, but uh, these were really, you don't, you dive deep into these, Thank uh, you. into the psychological and motivational uh, nature of these characters. The reason why we love fiction. Thank you. Well, Jacqueline, of course, we're here to talk about a very inconvenient scandal. And I'd like to give our listeners a little bit of the background of what's going on in the story, but without giving away any spoilers. So if you'll allow me, um, I'm going to go ahead and do that. And if you want to add anything, of course, we would love that at the end. Now, your story is a family drama that really explores the emotional consequences of loyalty, of deception, of jealousy. And you do it all against the backdrop of the natural world, which was one of the most beautiful parts of this book as well. Frankie Edelboro is a marine photographer. She returns home to Cape Cod with some exciting news. She's getting married. She's expecting a baby. And before she can really announce this and rejoice with the family, her father announces that he has news of his own. He is also getting married and also expecting a baby on the way. Now he's getting married at 60 to Frankie's best friend growing up. And of course, we've got the setup for a lot of tension already. But as the two of them, Frankie and Ariel, really struggle to adjust to this new twist in the relationship, Ariel's estranged mother comes on the scene, Carlotta. Now, Carlotta has been gone for a while, and nobody's exactly sure what has gone on in her absence and where she's been. But as her behavior gets more and more unpredictable, we see where Frankie now has to untangle these things that have happened in the past, because now we've got lives on the line. Would you like to add anything to that background? No, that was perfect. Okay, Great. wonderful. Well, we'll dive in. Chris will kick us off. Okay, I have to say for our listeners, it's a rich novel filled with deep emotion, some substantiated, some imagined, and some unfounded. It was a psychological examination of a human being, each and every one of us. The reader saw clearly during Frankie's reaction to her father's marriage to Frankie's best friend that Frankie was only considering that effect on her own life. Each of these characters sort of place themselves at the center of their own universe, which, by the way, we all do in the real world. This is the harsh reality. But it made the reader sort of think, could some of their problems or most of them been solved with a little empathy? And what did it take for Frankie, Ariel, Mac, Penn, and each of us in the real world to put somebody ahead of ourselves, even temporarily? This is not easy to do. It's not. And everyone, I mean, everyone to some degree is egocentric. You have to be in order to even uh, form your own personality and protect yourself and have boundaries from other people. And even people we think of, I was thinking about this this morning as selfless, okay, like the Dalai Lama or Mother Teresa. Those people are pretty egocentric too or you wouldn't know who they are because it fulfills their ego needs to be of service in such a way that, and, and at such magnitude that it, uh, they become leaders and they become people who we all look to as selfless. And of course they're getting something out of that. I mean, it isn't just, uh, it isn't just for the fact of doing it or we would never know who they are, but it, I mean, it, um, Frankie reacts very much to her own, uh, her own interest and her own pain when she gets the news about her father marrying her best friend. It's not only that it's to her, it is icky and it is, I mean, he's 60, she's 27. They're having a baby. She's, he's only been a widow for one year and Frankie's, Frankie's heart was her beloved mother because her father was always off adventuring the world, sort of styling himself after Jacques Cousteau. But so we were all egocentric, but then in a sense, we have to realize that it's doing for other people. It's including other people in our plans and our thoughts and caring for them 
that also makes us part of the group. Mm -hmm. And you can't survive unless you're part of the group. Even these stories about hermits who live in the wood, you know, they're watching people at the campground because they're lonely. And, you know, human beings, primates, you know, and we're, we're primates with makeup, you know, we can't, um, we can't survive without the group. So we have to uh, concede and gradually, you're absolutely right. All these conflicts in this story could have been solved if everyone at that certain, at the opening of the door had said, I have to consider how this other person feels. I have to consider how my daughter feels. I have to consider how my best friend feels. But uh, no one does that. And if if the, if everyone did that, there would be no stories. <laughs> if everybody just, you know, they would be little pamphlets, like everyone got along fine after that. <laughs> Bye. Well, the, it made the reader realize, sometimes a good fiction like this makes the reader realize, this is my world. This is what I do. This is what my sister did, did my best friend, my dad, because it wasn't, it was, it was also Ariel, Mac and Penn. Everybody was thinking of themselves. And I just thought, you know, we really do. We put ourselves at the center of our universe. It takes a lot of extra effort to say, I'm going to step out of that temporarily and really try to think how you feel. But you said a key word in there because you said boundaries, because sometimes we put ourselves at the center of the universe, like Frankie did because we don't want to be hurt anymore. Maybe that was part of her reason. I think that's partly true, is that she didn't want to risk. She already knew that something was going on that was emotionally going to be a, there was going to be a huge amount of emotional fallout in her family. And of course, for Frankie, her mother was gone. She was coming home seeking and hoping there's a lot in there about her thinking, maybe my dad will react to being a grandpa in a way that he's never reacted before. Maybe he'll notice me because, you know, he never really did notice me. He was basically this ephemeral figure when I was growing up. But it um, it it doesn't always work out that way. But that's what, in some ways, that's what maturity is. What growing up means is that you learn you're not three years old anymore saying, I want to eat right now. You know, as you grow up and grow older, you learn that there are more effective strategies for even for getting attention than being demanding and self-centered. Mm -hmm. Her dad didn't really learn that. No. Never. And, and I think... And boy, maybe this is, maybe I'm stepping into the abyss here, but I think that women learn that sooner and more thoroughly than men do because we have to, because we have to take care of these little creatures sometimes, you know, children, and we have to be the consensus builders at work. And while, while men are out saving France, you know, or something it, uh, so I think that that's something that may be a little more. A, a little easier or at least more um, alluring for women to learn. Mm -hmm. So true. Readers, this real life issues inside this novel that you're going to love. I'd love to dive into that just a little bit deeper in terms of how we come to some of those realizations. In your story, that father-daughter relationship was very pivotal. And Frankie writes this. Being a photographer meant being always a corollary rather than a participant. And that in some ways, being her father's daughter was the same. And I love that Frankie began to examine her relationship with her father from that adult perspective. She was thinking they did activities together, but there was no emotional intimacy. And, you know, he never asked her what frightened her or what she dreamed of. How did that realization come to Frankie? Did she have to examine her professional relationships and did it provide clarity for her in her treatment of people going forward? She had been to some degree self-centered as, as well. Her brother points out to her that when their mother died, he was as devastated as she was, but she fled. She headed off to 
go literally under the surface, under the sea and hide from her pain and travel the world in some of the ways that their father had always done. He was always off um, adventuring. And when he came home, he expected everybody to react positively and to give him the respect and approbation that he felt that he deserved. And that's very immature on, on his part. It um, she she did have to struggle to come to the realization that there were two choices. Either she would leave and not be a part of this family anymore, or she would stay and struggle to work it out. And those were choices. She couldn't see herself giving up, even though she was beloved of her fiance, later her husband in the book, and she knew that she would have a family of her own. She didn't want to give up her family of origin. And so she had to start to struggle. But one expects that if you're struggling and you're trying to make things right, at least you're going to get some credit for that. But she didn't necessarily get much credit for it, at least early on. She was just struggling in, she was sort of out there dancing on a wire. Yeah. I, I love throughout your story how this idea of being intentional in all of these relationships, it, you really showed the reader that throughout the story. And, and it made me pause at the end. I was thinking in terms of, you know, how are we being intentional in developing intimacy, in affirming others, in showing them that respect? So I loved that story just from the underlying idea of intentionality. When, um, whenever I listen to, you know, my, my guilty pleasure is listening to true crime podcasts so that I can find out things that I hope will never happen to me or anybody that whom I love. But all those stories begin with people not paying attention. Mm. It, it, and I'm not victim blaming here. But when people don't, as, as Oprah Winfrey says, people tell you who they are right away and you spend a whole lot of time not listening. You yeah. don't believe them. You yeah. think that they might be more like what you think that they are, but they tell you right away in, immediately who they are and what they expect and what their flaws are. And we spend 20 years and 10 years in therapy trying to figure out how we can accept that truth. But we knew it already. Everything, it's sort of like everything we come to know as adults, we knew at the start, at the starting gate. Yeah. I wish we had By that wisdom way, though at 17. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. By the way, this story, I don't know if you know this, and I don't know if it's important, but it's based on my real life. One day I came home to Chicago to visit my father. I was around Frankie's age in the story and my father had been widowed. My mom died very young, the same age as Beatrice in the novel. And he, when I came home, I walked into the kitchen, you know, and set my little kid down and my father, and I looked at the woman sitting at the table and I said, Barbara, I had gone to high school with her. And this was my father's new beloved and they became engaged. And I, I really thought for the rest of uh, the time that I knew her, that I never really got into the kitchen. I stumbled over the threshold and that's where I stayed because I could not get beyond the fact that um, my father was in love with and about to marry someone who she was a year older or I probably would still be in therapy. But mm -hmm. wow. and they never did get married, but that the the feelings that redounded to that were enormous. They were enormous. They were like a tidal wave. Wow. Thanks for sharing that. We did not know that fact. And Krista and I were talking a little bit before the show about being a parent, about having a parent and wanting them to still support you throughout your life. And I'll give you an example. I had my nieces. I have 30 nieces and nephews. I had a couple of them here this week. My brother wants to get a different house from the one they grew up in. They had a breakdown. No, we grew up there. And at one, on one side of the coin, I said, let dad live his life. You're all grown up. 
But when dad lives his life like your dad and does something quite shocking and not normal, you know, of course this does happen. This is a tough the movie thing. stars. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, some presidential candidates and things like that, but not necessarily the ordinary folks from the West side of Chicago. I guess the truth is forever a parent and forever a child. Doesn't matter how old you are. You're still my parent and I expect certain things of you and you're still my child and I expect certain things. Wow. And that is absolutely true in, in relation to your own children and in relation to the culture, your work culture and your friends, you grow up in relation to your parents, you still need and expect. And with some justification, the, that you, when you go to your parent, it's a haven and you'll be looked after because that's what parents are supposed to do. And again, with those true crime podcasts I talked about, this is something that is often missing in these terrible stories is that people don't get the comfort, the love and comfort that they deserve from the people who ought to give it to them. That's profound. I only listen to fiction and nonfiction podcasts, but I think I need, we need to log into true crime, Kristen. Sounds like Agreed. fun. <laughs> okay. I want to ask you, okay, this just hit me really strong because I can personally relate to this. The relationship between Frankie and Ella Bella, her old schoolgirl nemesis, AKA mean girl was something we could all relate to. The bully Ella Bella finally confesses her own insecurities and her need to, I'm going to quote, get them before they get me. Hindsight, she, she totally understood what she'd been doing to all these girls. She even wrote an essay titled, I was the mean girl to justify her actions. She believed there was a culture that fostered her, fostered her behavior. I just had to say, how did Frankie forgive or accept Alabella? Or was Frankie unknowingly falling into that same trap that we all do? Like, be nice to the mean girl so I'm not the victim. Well, I think she did forgive her. And I think the reason that she forgave her is because it's very hard for a grudge to survive a revelation like that. And the reason that Ella Bella was the way that I was supposed to change that name in the book, and I refused to change it because it was so over the top and goofy that um, that I wanted to keep it. Um, it, it the reason she was like that was because she was the only daughter expected to be perfect of her society parents. And she reacted to that with a certain amount of first fear and then aggression, which is how you do react to those things. And, and only when she was able to make other people feel lesser than she was she able to feel important? And boy, you know, you scratch a bully anywhere, you find a scared little kid who isn't getting the love that it, that she expected and deserved, but had to, um, at one point in the book, uh, her uh, she says to Frankie, you weren't my mother's daughter. You don't know how it was. You had a mother who celebrated whatever you did and uh, praised whatever you did. And I had a mother who the standard, she just kept moving the bar higher. So Frankie really understands and to a certain degree empathizes with Ella Bella because her father, while he approved of her majoring in marine biology, he thought that she, becoming an underwater photographer was a really trivial thing for a scientist to do. And so in some ways, Frank, uh, Frankie is still trying to prove herself to her father in the way that Ella Bella is trying to prove herself to her parents. And Ella Bella made a real effort to be a better human being. And how can you resist that? Really? You know, unless the person has done something so egregious and horrible that she talks about uh, Ella Bella when she's she's a journalist and when she's doing interviewing Frank, she talks about how much she envied her relationship with Ariel because they had what 
uh, Alabella never had. And she calls it the we of me, that they were they were each other's heart and they stood united with each other all those many years since they were 10 years old. And um, and Alabella had to sort of conquer and slay people's egos in order to have a group that surrounded her. And they surrounded her out of fear, not love. And, and I love the name Ella Bella. Let's just say it because she's so bossy and such a bully. And she's got this fancy little name that makes you even dislike <laughs> her even more. But, you know, isn't it true? Like, uh, I'm sorry, or admitting a weakness goes a long way. I look at all of our, all the people that we really respect in this world and all of them has a flaw or a weakness or something that went terribly wrong in their life. Sometimes we're afraid to show that because we want to be strong and perfect. But when she started to expose her insecurities, that's when we started to like her. Right. Right. And Frankie wondered how she could have missed that for so long. But then again, you know, those are the, you know, crow's feet come with maturity, but so does wisdom. And it, um, it, it's one of the things that we receive as a gift of growing older and growing up is that we start to understand when we come outside that solipsistic existence in which it's all me, 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 we find out that other people have enormous pain. And even some of the villain, the villain in this book, if you will, the person who nobody knows what she's up to, which is Ariel's long absent mother, has an enormous amount of, of pain in her background too. And of course, it depends on what you actually do. That's, I mean, it depends on how far you go. You know, you don't have sympathy for the devil, but there's a certain amount of understanding that comes with that, uh, with learning that history. Fascinating. Jacqueline, your story also explores the idea of home or a haven, as you referenced a little bit ago. Frankie thought it was a place, maybe the place where she grew up, a specific, you know, home that's been in the family for decades. But she realizes after contemplating the natural world, and the marine creature she photographs, that home might be something more. And I wanted to ask you about that. Is it a place where you simply feel protected? You know, is it about the people? And I wanted to see, too, if you thought that the natural world helped Frankie interpret her thoughts in that regard. I think it did because she saw the ways in which, in which uh, other creatures, wild creatures, protected their own and cre it, as long as long ago I, I when I was thinking about this I was looking up what some people philosophers had thought about the concept of home and it really boils down to love home really is where the heart is and that was what you know Homer was saying in 700 BC about Odysseus, you know, home for him was Penelope. It was love. It was going to a place where he knew that he didn't have to earn through battle or bravery or, or intelligence. He didn't have to earn the love that he was given. And I think that home, as it's defined, it's, it's something that you don't have to fight to deserve a place where you are included and, and even welcomed and it may not be the best place in the world, but you're recognized as being part of that group. I know that when when a hundred years ago, when I was a student teacher, I taught at a what we used to call baby jail. It was uh, the the juvenile facility in in Illinois. And when kids would run away, the first place they would go would be to the lousy home that, that they came from and which was in part responsible for the reason that they were there because it's a place where everyone knows your name and they may not always treat you well, but it's a place that's familiar to you and you keep on hoping. It, I believe you see this again, you know, I don't want to refer to our closest genetic relative chimpanzees too much, but even with other primates, you see them saying, you see them essentially 
wanting to establish a place that is safe for themselves and for their children. And when they don't succeed, they try again. They try again and again to find that. And it's been written about, you know, I mean, famously by the Bard of New Hampshire, Robert Frost, that when you when you have to go there, they have to take you in. That's what home is. Yeah, I love that. It it just makes me think about that strong desire to be known and also unconditionally accepted. It's it's very strong. You know, we we're human human beings don't just blend in with the environment. You know, we can't just go out and uh and be okay anywhere that we land. We have to we make a home. And we our home it limits our choices and it shapes the options that we do. You know, you uh, when people relocate, when they go to live in other places with other cultures, the first thing they try to do is install some of what they bring with them, which is the concept of home and what that means to them. Yeah, very true. Oh, that's wisdom right there. I love that. I, I just, who can't relate to that? I got a little choked up when you start saying all that about home because we, I think of my childhood home right away. And it's a little town in Western New York and I love it so much. I'm just so happy when I get there. Kristen loves Niagara Falls, she fights for Niagara Falls. And it's true, it stays with you forever, the good and the bad of it. So before we let you go, Jacqueline Machard, and let me put up a copy of the book, A Very Inconvenient Scandal, Everybody. Did you hear this interview? You are gonna love this book. Give us a little clue about what you might be working on next. Well, you know, I have mentioned true crime. I am writing my first novel about crime. And in my novels, traditionally, there have been some mysteries and some wrongdoing and some people who think of doing bad things. But this one is really based on or inspired by, let's say, the uh, the first criminal trial I covered as a young reporter back in Madison, Wisconsin, when I was Frankie uh, Attleboro's age, which was the... Uh, now talk about mayhem. It was about a young woman who was a brilliant biology student. And she came from Chicago, as I did. Straight A student, beautiful, won all the prizes, the homecoming queen. She came to the university. And after one year, she gave that all up and became a high-priced call girl. And she was accused of murdering two of her most devoted, devoted clients. Wow. And uh, what has stayed with me for all these many years and who caused me, what caused me to write this story was one time, you know, you get, even if you're an accused murderer, you get to go to the bathroom and we're standing in the ladies room at the courthouse. And I asked her how things were going. And she said, you know, so far so good. And when she was convicted of one of the murders, she said under her breath, they got me for the one I didn't do. Oh, wow. And that woman in real life, who's my age, now she's in her 60s, she went to prison. After 12 years, she was a model prisoner. She could have applied for parole. She's been eligible for, for parole six, five, six times never applied for parole, not once. This wow. is this is incredibly fascinating. This is going to make a great novel. I can't I wait so. to. I, well, okay, you have to come back because we. I can already think of deep discussion on this with just the summary. <laughs> Sounds it's a day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And in the meantime, listeners, please connect with Jacqueline Machard. You're going to want to. You can find her on her website, JacquelineMachard.com. She has Facebook, X, formerly Twitter, Instagram. Now on her website, she has a newsletter that you can sign up for. And she does a little blog on there that I saw is just so heartfelt and meaningful, but also really funny. Just love that <laughs> little blog. So thank you so much. It's been a pleasure having you. What fun this was to dive down deep into a very inconvenient scandal. Thank you so much, guys. I appreciate it. Bye-bye. <laughs>
Well, what a fantastic interview with Jacqueline Michard. First of all, we touched on so many deep topics that were in the story. And I have a whole bunch that kind of are going around in my mind. But one of them was this idea of checking your motives when you are a person who is trying to do good in the world. And, you know, one of the things that you brought up with her is the fact that we all have inside of us some selfishness, maybe some narcissism. And I'm not sure that we all take the time to check our motives about why we are doing something that looks selfless. What do you think about that? Yeah, this is a good point, Kristen. But then let's take it a step further. Are we always honest with ourselves? Maybe we're not. Maybe we tell ourselves we're doing it for a different reason. But deep inside, we like the notoriety or the fame. She brought a cup up a couple of people, um, the Dalai Lama and Mother Teresa, whom we all adore. But I thought this was so intriguing. Yes, they're doing something for a good cause, but they're also very pleased to be uh, uh, someone that people follow and listen to and respect. It gives them a voice. Um, it gives them a platform. And I never thought of it that way. Yeah, we all have a little narcissism. We all do. It's when only we are important and we consistently put ourselves over everyone else. And in that regard, like I said, maybe we're lying to ourselves. What do you think? No, I think that's a, a really good point. And in this story in particular, though, we had somebody who put himself first unapologetically. And at least he was honest about it. I mean, he wasn't trying to do good in one area and make it about himself. He just was about himself unapologetically. Mm -hmm. So I, I think maybe being honest with others, honest with ourselves about our motives, maybe is a, a good way to go forward. But always having that internal check in, you know, why am I doing this? What am I getting out of it? And is that also consistent with my values? Mm -hmm. And how about this? Take it a little bit on the flip side. What about we purposely trying to be honest with ourselves about someone else's motives? You know, she said, you meet someone and in the first half hour, you really know if you look at the red flags and the clues, who that person is, we ignore it. Why? We need a friend. We like that person. We think they're good looking. We think they're funny. We think they're intelligent. We want to connect with people for all kinds of different reasons. Maybe they're popular. Let's look at the mean girl. Why are people attracted to a mean girl and blindly follow this person around? They're afraid of being hurt. They don't want to be a victim, but they actually are a victim. They're putting themselves at, at risk. I think this was fascinating to me that take a good long look and listen to the red flag, because if you don't listen now, you're going to be hurting 10 years from now. Yeah, that is so true. And, and don't we always fill in the blanks too? about people, you know, it, that must be their motivation, or that's probably what they were thinking or doing. And we can't do that, because it lands us in a lot of trouble and heartache later, as you pointed out. But also, you know, there's that recognition that human beings are complicated, and they are contradictory, and they do have mixed motives, some good, some bad. And that surely was explored in a very inconvenient truth. And she's very good at that, Jacqueline. He sure is. And even we are complicated and we don't do everything perfect all the time. Maybe we think we have good intentions, but maybe we don't. The human psyche is a very complicated thing. Um, I wanted to talk about one other thing, the loss of a loved one and never allowing that space to be filled by another. So Frankie was angry that her dad was engaged to her old best friend. Okay. I get it. She's your age. This is a shocker. This isn't going to be your mom. You're never going to call her mom. It's not fair. It doesn't feel fair. But would she have accepted anyone? Because she was still really hurting from her mom. And I've never been in this situation. How do you accept anyone ever? Maybe you say they're never going to replace. They're just going to be in addition to. Because this is a tough thing at any age. Yeah, well, I was in this position, actually. And I had to recognize that my parent was a separate whole human being who is entitled to make decisions that are good for them and that might bring them joy and happiness. And I think that's a big part of separating yourself as a child versus an adult child of an adult parent. <laughs> and, and you recognize that they have 
wow, hobbies and interests and things when they were young that they maybe put aside for you to ra be raised. And I love that different aspect of the parent-child relationship where you're dealing with them from a more mature perspective. And that is you are also an adult entitled to happiness and joy and pursuing your interests. I like that you said that, Kristen, because as the adult parent, I want to say to kids, hey, we are people too. And we may sell our home that you lived in forever and move somewhere else. It's okay. Because we just learned home is where the heart is. It's where the people you love. It's not a building or a place. But I like that. Because kids do want to impose restrictions upon their parents to keep everything in this perfect little tidy box where it doesn't work anymore. I like that. Yeah. Kids out yeah. there, youth out there. And then, of course, we've got to realize our kids are adults. They're not kids anymore. We can't tell them what to do all the time. We have to say, hey, I raised them. They're adults. They're going to make good and bad choices. This is a hard thing to do. Take it from me. Yeah. My kids Absolutely. were here. They'd say, mom, you never let us make our own choices. I'd be like, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> and you're wrong. <laughs> All right. So anyway, thank you so much, everybody. It's been a lot of fun. We love Jacqueline Michard for a good while now. And we're so happy about this book. Tune back in because we're going to be interviewing Lisa C and Lady Tan's Circle of Women, Karma Brown, What Wild Women Want, Patricia Cornwell, Unnatural Death, Jenny Colgan, Midnight at the Christmas Bookshop, and John Mars, The Vacation. And thank you, listeners. We continue to grow every week. We're so thankful for you listening and sharing our socials. These are the kinds of great, healthy, deep conversations that we love to have with these amazing authors, and you like them too. So thank you. We want you to stay on the radar with us, of course. Follow us at bookstormpodcast.com. You can find us on Facebook, on Instagram, on X, on TikTok, and you can find us on YouTube. Search for Bookstorm and Podcast, and hopefully we will come right up with these fantastic authors. Until next time, listeners, one of the best ways to brave the storm is to dive down deep into life-changing fiction.